Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 26. And I gave the Bible study today a title in the form of a question. And the question is this. Are you sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit? Because if you haven't already, it's important to recognize how we can easily come to God with our whole lives figured out and planned out. And we come to God with our plans. We've already figured out. We already know how we want it to to end. We know how we want it to happen. We have a few ideas of how to make things happen. And we bring that to God. We formulate it in a conversation with God. And we kind of tell God what to do. And it's not entirely bad. I mean, I think it's we've got something in our hearts and our desires. But you can't come to God with things figured out. The Bible says that God's ways are not our ways in Isaiah 55. And we need to come and pray according to God's will. We want to be able to say, God, what you have for us is what we want. It reminded me of the time, one of the episodes in the life of the children of Israel under the leadership of Joshua, where they're coming into the land and they experience great victory over the city of Jericho in a very unusual way. And then after the victory, they go into the city of Ai, the very next city as they're conquering the land, and they experience great defeat. And the big difference between the two is, coming into Jericho, they were deep in prayer, receiving their plans from God. Coming into Ai, they thought they had it all figured out. And the problem with Ai is that people lost their lives. And there was great defeat. A man planned his way without seeking God. Would you turn over to Proverbs, hold your place in Acts, and turn to Proverbs with me. I want you to see these verses. In Proverbs, let's start in verse 16. So Proverbs are right after the Psalms. And it, again, this great encouraging proverb, a piece of wisdom for us. Proverbs 16, notice with me in verse 9. The Bible already speaks to this attitude that we can have, followers of God. We can have this. It says, A man's heart, Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And how many times have our plans been changed by the Lord? Where he has taken and interrupted what we thought would happen, how we wanted it to happen, and he changed our ways. And even so, as you think of this passage, a man plans, a man's heart plans his ways, so many stop with the first part of that verse. They stop with their plans. I mean, after all, we're reading the Bible. After all, we're praying. After all, we consider ourselves good Christians. So, you know, let's just plan our ways. It's not sin. It's not rebellion. But as we're making our plans, we have to look for the direction of the Lord. Because it's just possible. It's very possible that your plans are not the ways of the Lord. As good as they might be. And we we make a great failure when God directs our steps, but we stick to our plans. We make a great failure when God directs our steps in a different way than our plans, and it ends in disaster. You know, we can have the best plans in the world, but if they're not from God, you can expect defeat and difficulty and discouragement. Let me show you another proverb in Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 21. Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 21. And by the way, if you choose, you know, as you're reading the Bible and praying every day, if you choose as part of your reading plan to read one chapter of the Proverbs every day, there's 31 chapters, this is the kind of wisdom that will be sown into your heart. You won't memorize every single verse and you won't remember everything that you read, but you're depositing wisdom into your heart so the Holy Spirit can bring it back. And this is a great wisdom scripture in verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. 
So there's a lot of things going on in our minds and our hearts, but it's God's counsel that's unmovable. Let me give you another one, chapter 14 in the Proverbs. This is very common. Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 12. Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 12. Listen to this carefully, church. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. And there are ways in our lives we just think this is the way we should go, but the end is going to be death. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and what? He will direct your path. So I ask you again, are you sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit? We drop in, coming back to Acts chapter 8 now, we drop into a time by way of review of excitement and difficulty mixed in the early church. We're in the early years of the church's birth and life and formation. And you remember in Acts chapter 1, Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem, the Spirit of God will come upon you, you will be my witnesses. And where did he say? He gave the location. He said, in Jerusalem... Judea and Samaria, which surrounds Jerusalem, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the will of God for the church. But up to chapter 6 and 7, the church basically stayed in Jerusalem. And they became, in some ways, comfortable. They weren't necessarily in any kind of rank of rebellion or you know, just massive disobedience but they also weren't like on fire in obedience either. They stayed in Jerusalem when they were very clearly told that the ministry would go beyond Jerusalem, but they stayed. And so you can find, and this is something interesting, like you can be doing the right thing and still have more, God still have more for you. You don't have to be in a massive place of rebellion for God to turn your life around. He can turn your life around when you're doing something well. When you're on the way obeying God. And that's where the early church is. So what happened? Stephen, Stephen, the the person that was serving the widows, he had this occasion to stand before the religious rulers. They lied about him. They, They made false accusations against him. He defended them with one of the most articulate, clear presentations of the history of Israel and the gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing to the resurrection of Jesus. And what did they do? They killed him. They murdered him. That was his reward. And in that, we are introduced to a man who was watching it all, Saul. And it was through Saul, through his persecution of the church, that God stirred up their comfort and ease. As they were settling down, God wanting them to rise up. And he allowed the persecution to come. And he allowed Stephen to be stoned. And he allowed Saul to come against the church. He allowed it to happen and he used it. Remember, anything God allows, God uses. Nothing is wasted. And sometimes God will give us this gentle little push to get us going, to move us forward. Sometimes it's gentle, sometimes it's dramatic. And so part of the persecution sent one of the results of the persecution, we learn Philip was sent to Samaria. And he was faithful, ministering to a people group that was an outcast, considered well beyond the gospel in the eyes of the Jew, but not in the eyes of God. God had a plan for Samaria, and he sent Philip to Samaria. And you know what the gospel did? It broke out in revival. The Samaritans embraced the gospel because God loved the Samaritans and God was using Philip so much so that there was even this fake believer. We learned his name. We learned, we met him last time. His name is Simon. He was a fake believer, a make believer. And God uses Peter with the gift of discernment to, to bring that out. And now with that in mind, come to verse 26. Our attention now in chapter eight is back to Philip in the midst of revival. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. 
And that will be the focus of our time today, those simple truths in the life of Philip. The first thing I want you to notice in his life is that he is a great example of a yielded vessel. He is yielded to the will of God. Philip is just open. If we were to put words to what yielded means and what it means to be open to God, we would probably use words like this. You, you, probably on the lips of Philip and his family and his prayers would be something like, you know what, God, whatever you have for me, I'm open. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will say whatever you want me to say. I will do whatever you want me to do. I'm open. I'm not married to anything on this earth. I'm married to you. I am your bride, Jesus. And I just want what you want in my life. I'll go to a place you don't want me to go. I'll do things that make me uncomfortable. I'll do things that may, are unfamiliar to me, whatever it is. And so Philip goes to the area of Samaria and there's a revival. And in the middle of this revival, in the middle of such great things, comes this angel with a message. And the message to Philip is, get up and leave this revival. It's time to go. Now I want you to stand back for a second and just consider how hard these words must have been to hear. In the midst of something wonderful and great, in the midst of like, this is what I was born for. This is what I want. I want to see cities transformed. I want to see lives change. I want to see families saved. I want to see deliverance and power and signs and wonders. And in the very middle of that, the answer was, it's time to get up and go. And what made it harder, or what could have made it harder, is he wasn't given the whole story. He wasn't told what he was going to. He wasn't told everything that unfolds. We're reading the Bible. You, know, you, have to dis, you have to step back and pause as you're reading the Bible sometimes because we know what's going to happen. He's going to meet this Ethiopian eunuch. He's going to get saved. He's gonna, like, we know how it happens, but like Philip has no idea. What do you mean leave? And you want me to go where? From Samaria to Gaza? Now, we haven't talked about this in a while because it's been a while since we've been in chapter one. But remember, the book of Acts was written by Luke to a man named Theophilus. And I think this is a little insight that remember that Luke is writing to someone, not only to Theophilus then, but to us now, that where he is being called to was another place of isolation and aloneness. And he just wants you to know, hey, by the way, I'm calling you to the desert. He was sent to the desert from a place of revival. You know, we often use desert as a time of barrenness, a time of emptiness. We, we, he doesn't know where. I mean, he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. All he knows is he's been given direction and he has to leave to the south to the desert. This old Gaza, this old Philistine city, referring to the deepest, darkest desert. Now, Philip's faithfulness, you know, what's happening here? What, why would God... Why would God call someone out of a great, wonderful time in Samaria, especially to a place where nobody wanted to go to? Philip went there and great revival broke out. Why would God do that? I believe this is an example of God testing his faithfulness. Testing his faithfulness. If I was delivering this Bible study to a group of pastors and elders, church planters, I, I would remind them that along the way, their call to ministry is going to be tested. Their call to ministry will be tested, like Philip here. He's in the midst of revival. It's everything you would want to see. And it's like God saying, are you willing to leave all of this for nothing? Are you willing to lay all this down for me? Just to step out on my voice. Did, did you think that the step of faith would be just to move somewhere and never leave? Or did you think the step of faith would just to be settled down, comfort and ease, never take steps of faith again? Or, or how about this? Will you serve one, or even at this point, he doesn't even know, are you willing to serve zero? Just, just me. Just, if you just know me, is that enough for you? As you would to be in the middle of revival. Are you willing to serve when nobody sees you? Nobody knows you? Are you willing to follow me even when things look and sound absurd? You know, if I was teaching pastors here, this is where all kinds of church growth methods and seminars and, you know, guys are just so caught up in the external instead of just knowing God. 
God will take care of his church. And I think, I know you're not pastors or elders, but listen, as you follow Jesus, God will take care of the things in your life. It's not so important. I think with pastors, I tell them, like, it's not so important, like, that people know your name. Like, there, there's a big difference between people knowing your name. Now, understand this. It's inevitable. People are going to know your name. If you introduce yourself to someone, they're going to know your name. If you teach the Bible to more than a couple people, they're going to know your name. So knowing your name is not the issue. It, it, there's a difference between people knowing your name and, and this, and this is a very clear distinction. There's a difference between people knowing your name and you wanting people to know your name. There's a big difference between the two. And that's a big heart issue. Because I'm telling you right now, the Bible is clear. God will share his glory with no man. And God will share his glory with no woman and no child. No, I mean, as silly as it sounds, I don't even know why I need to say this, but I will. No one is greater than Jesus Christ. And nobody cares. Nobody should care about the vessels that God chooses to use. All glory and honor and power belong to Jesus. And there's a big difference. And don't think it just happens to pastors. Don't think it just happens to teachers and Bible teachers. It's like, I want people to know my name. I want, no, no, it, it doesn't matter. Your name will come and go. But the name of Jesus Christ saves souls, changes lives. And so maybe it's just a heart check for you and for me today. Yeah, of course people are going to know your name. Of course you're going to communicate yourself with your name. Yes, yes, yes. But is it because you really want people to know your name? You're just going to find the fickleness of people will discourage you very quickly. And people forget your name. And people come and go. But the name of the Lord stands. And here, Philip, I don't know what test is happening. There could be a lot of different ways. But it was a big call. It, it, this was a big call in Philip's life. And I don't want you just to associate this call being open, sensitive, and open to the Holy Spirit. I don't want you just to associate it like to moving to another place. Then you'll miss the whole point of the passage. This was the call of faith for Philip. That it was his. This was God working in his life to move, you know, fulfilling Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This can be lived out in a lot of different ways. It may not be a call to move to a different physical location. It could just be a call to move into some kind of practical Christian service. It could be a call to move across the street and talk to your neighbor. It could be a call to move to talk to your coworker or your boss. It could be a call to move to extend forgiveness. It could be a million different things. But when you receive the call to arise and go, you have no other choice than to do what he does here in verse 27. You need to arise and go. He arose and went. Now, I hope you like to write in your Bibles. You should buy highlighters, different colors. We have them downstairs. You can get them different places. I hope you write in your Bibles. Write however you do on your app or on your phone. But next to verse 27, don't miss this. This is foundational in the health and the vitality and the power of the church of any generation. And it's these two words, immediate obedience. You don't have a verse in between. You don't have a verse in between of Philip hearing and considering. Instead, the Bible's clear that he heard and obeyed. Because I've found over time, it's very easy to talk myself out of obedience. It's very easy to rationalize away great steps of faith. And before you know it, you have talked yourself out of great things. <laughs> God has said, go, you heard him right the first time, and then over time, it just completely is in a place where you no longer want to obey, and then it passes, 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 and you just don't want that for your life, immediate obedience, and the difficulty, of course, is that he wasn't given the whole picture, he wasn't given every step. God's will comes one step at a time. 
not three steps at a time, not five steps at a time, not a hundred steps at a time. God's will comes one step at a time. Hearing God here in this message from the angel, he was just given, you know, in this case, he was given one step and then the direction to go, but he doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what to look for. He doesn't know anything except it's time to go. And this is the direction I want you to go. That's all he has. God's step comes, God's will comes one step at a time. I would go so far to say that there isn't a second step until you take the first. There is no second step. Well, okay, okay, if I do this, then what will happen here? And then what will happen here? And what about that? And how about this? None of those are going to be answered until you take the first step. That's something to be discovered. The life of faith is a life of discovery. Well, well, you know, Ed, I won't take these big steps of faith until I understand. You won't get understanding until you take the step of faith. Are you with me? Amen, church. Hello. Anybody with me today? You're not going to get full understanding. Then you would be living life by understanding. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, if God would just explain it to me, well, then you'd be living life a life by explanation. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, if God will just give me everything, what's it going to look like in five years? Well, then you'll be living by your five-year plan. The Bible says that we live by faith. And faith requires you not to know everything. Then it wouldn't be faith. If you knew everything, then it wouldn't be faith. You wouldn't have anything to trust God for. And he's not going to give you all the steps, just like here. It's discovered. It's a life of discovery. I don't know how many people you've ever talked to, everyone that's ever, anyone that's ever said this to you, but they'll say something like, you know, Christianity is so boring. Nah, man, you don't got it. That's not true. Christianity is not boring at all. It's exciting and vibrant and scary. And, ex- and did I say exciting already? Yes, it's exciting twice. It's amazing to follow the Lord, but he's only giving you one step at a time, which leads us to another question. It's probably one of the most popular questions that I get as a pastor, and that is this. How do I know the will of God? How can I discover the will of God? And we make it so much harder like some kind of mystical, weird, we need an angel to visit, we need to be up in the mountains all by ourselves, and then maybe somehow, we make it so complicated. So let me give you a couple of things, if you're taking notes, that will simplify how to discover the will of God for your life. And all of this is predicated upon you being a born-again believer in full relationship with Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and... It will help you if you read the Bible and pray every day. You'll be a lot farther along discovering the will of God in your life if you will just read the Bible and pray every day. But here, number one, if you're trying to discern whether something is the will of God in your life, number one, is it according to God's word? Because if it's not according to God's word, I can say, I don't care what it is. I don't care how you explain it. I don't care how you put lipstick on it. Doesn't matter how you try to make it come to me. I had a young lady come up last night and she was so excited. She said, I think from your Bible study, God has given me the word. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married. And so I needed to ask her a few questions that that may not be the will of God for her life. So she's all excited. And here she comes to Ed to blow it for her. But here she is. I, I can't just let that slide. My very first question is, are you a believer? A born again believer? Yes. Then the next question is, is he a born-again believer? And she hesitated a little bit. She said, well, he's a new believer. And I said, okay, then here's my recommendation. Before you see this as the grand answer for all the rest of your life, I believe you guys should do premarital counseling. There's a series of circumstances in her life that she shared with me that I won't share with you, but I gave her that direction. Because yes, marriage is according to God's word, but not always. Did you know that? Marriage is according to God's word, but not always. And you want to be able to walk through the pathway, is it according to God's word? If it is, green light, number two. If it's according to God's word, green light, number two, do you have 
a courage, a boldness, or even what the Bible would say, a peace that passes all understanding to move forward with what God has placed upon your heart. Now, let me just clarify here because I've met, I've met people, even personally, eye to eye, in very serious times that will come to me and say, I have a peace about it, but they have a peace about sin. You can't have a real God peace about sin. Did you know that? That's impossible. It's absolutely 100% impossible. When you, what you're about to do is sinful and it's wrong, you cannot have a peace about that. You may have talked yourself into it. You may have listened to other people's advice. You may be copping some bad attitude to a bad decision so you can justify it the rest of your life, but it is impossible for you to have a peace over a sinful wrong decision. So the peace that I'm talking about is a peace that God gives for you to be bold in taking the next step of faith and obeying him. And if you have a peace about it, and you have boldness and courage that God is. Remember what, I think it was in Philippians, Paul said that God both works in you to will, that's the desire, and to do, but listen, for his good pleasure. So you want to discern the will of God? God will give you the boldness and the strength to follow through. So it's not according, it's not sinful, so it's according to God's word. God has given you a boldness and a peace. And then thirdly, you want to look for you want to look for are the circumstances of your life lining up to go forward in this step of faith? Are the circumstances lining up? Now, some of you might be new to Christianity. Some of you may not even have a relationship with God today. So I'm going to use a phrase that Christians use all the time, and I want to explain it to you so you realize. Because we have, you know, you could say we have language of the Bible, and we have language, we could call it Christian ease, if you will. And we say all these things, and a lot of Christians understand. And sometimes people outside of, of the church, outside of faith, don't understand. So what we would say, are, do, we, do you see open or closed doors? And that's a Christian phrase that describes what I'm saying here. Are the circumstances lining up? And it's a great word picture, by the way. I mean, a closed door that's locked, like just in your house or here in the building. If the door is closed and locked, it says something to you. You know what it says? You can't come in. That's it. You can't come in. Unless you have a key, you can't go through that locked door. That's the key. That's why it's locked. It's closed and locked. To restrict access. Well, God will do that sometimes. He will close doors to restrict your progress. And he uses circumstances. The exact opposite. If the door is open, then it invites you to come through. Come on in. The doors are open. And we use that language. You use those word pictures all the time. And so is it according to God's word? Has God given you a boldness and courage to step through it? And are the doors, everything lining up? The only thing that's left, it's, there's not a fourth one. You know, I'm not going to make it complicated. And if we did have a fourth one, it wouldn't be. And then God explains your rest of your life to you so you can take the step of faith. That's not going to happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a step of faith. And it's going to be challenging. You might even find people along the way don't understand you. That's why it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. You might even have somebody come with you and say, and they take out their phone and you're like, what are you doing, man? Don't text. We're having a conversation. No, let me get my calculator out because what you're saying is here. It'll never never happen. You're going to go broke. You're going to be bankrupt. You're like, hey, bro, I don't know how God's going to take care of the money, but I know God's going to take care of me. It's a peace that passes all understanding. People want to explain things away. I think, you know, Pastor Byron and Emily came to us from the mission field. They've been on the mission field in Ukraine for many, many years. And any missionary that's, that, will, that, that feels a call to step out and move around the world, sell all their stuff, there are always people that come that will say, what are you thinking? They don't understand. Why would you do that? Don't sell your stuff. Put it in storage. So when you, it's like, no, I don't plan on coming back. I'm gone. This is God's call in my life. If I come back, we'll start over. But this is God's will. And then you'll have people who just don't understand. They're not walking in faith. They're not walking in trust. You know, the, the, the people on television, all the weird stuff of faith, it's wrong. They're used, they just so, they, walking in faith is following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Are you guys here, still here? It's so quiet today. I know the snow bums everyone out. I get it. It bums me out too. But walking in faith, walking in faith, is following the Holy Spirit. It's not following some pastor. 
and what he has to say and what he tells you, it's following the Lord. And any pastor is not leading to the Lord, get a new pastor. He's not truly a shepherd or an under-shepherd. Anyone drawing attention to themselves. I mean, let's be honest. If Philip, he's a human, I can think of many excuses he could come up with. Come on, God, I'm in the middle of revival. That's why you sent me to Samaria. Come on, God. You're sending me to the desert. Come on, God, what's next? Come on, God, I'm not called to Gaza. Heard that a thousand times. I'm not called to Gaza. Come on, God, I don't understand. Come on, God, give me more information. And then we always have that Christian part. Well, God, I hear you. I'm going to do it. I, I'm gonna, but, but let me pray about it. What do you need to pray about? You heard my voice. I sent you an angel. What do you want? I want a little bit more information. I want to protect my comfort. And I know we're removed so many years from Philip, but this heart is still in the church today. I think back of the last few years of challenges in the Western church and the church around the world, but in the church of the U.S. has been super challenging. God revealing things in our heart. And one of the greatest revelations, I think, for the church at large is a lack of worshiping the one true God. Imagine that. Being a faithful churchgoer, but worshiping comfort and ease. We look at the Old Testament, we think of all these weird idolatrous practices but idolatry is alive and well in the 21st century. The Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God, not our comfort. You are not the central focus of life. Life is not to you and for you and unto you. Life is for Jesus, to Jesus, unto Jesus. He alone has all power and authority. He alone that can change. The world doesn't surround you. I know that, you know, again, we come gather every weekend because we need to be reset because you're going to walk out the doors and the world's going to keep telling you, the world is going to say, you're the center, you're the center, you're the most important. Take care of yourself, protect yourself, pamper yourself. It's all about self. And it's just so discouraging to look at self so much because we fall so short of God's ideal. At times it's, There's gracelessness among us. At times there's unforgiveness. At times there's a lack of mercy. Why? Because we're so focused on self. So Philip is getting this call as we do. I think of the last few years, you know, even in the last few years, I was was just thinking, man, I've been walking with the Lord for 31 years, delivered from a radical life of sin. I mean, just the the life of self-destruction and destruction of everyone else. But after 30 years of walking with the Lord, he's still revealing new things. And I wonder what God's revealed to you in the last three years. But, but I mean, real bona fide things that will lead me to grow in grace. And one of them was all this about stay, taking steps of faith and change. I, I've been sharing with you for years that I love change. I love to see change. I, I love to move forward and change. I, I love to test things. And even if we fail, it's okay. Let's try, let's try, let's try. I love change. But the last three years, as challenging as they've been, God revealed something to me about me that I needed to learn and I can learn any other way. And it was just this simple truth. I love change when I'm the one making the change. I don't like change when it's imposed upon me. I don't like it at all. And you know, there's a lot of things that God was showing me, but as a pastor, he was giving me an empathetic heart for us as a church because you often are the responders to changes that the Lord lays on my heart. (laughs) And I always want to present them and I want to walk with us and lead and I don't want it to be abrupt or disruptive in any way like humanly. But God is just adding an empathetic part to my pastoral ministry to remind, you know, Ed, the way you're feeling right now, that's how the church feels. I'm like, oh, yes. And I put you in a position, Ed, to make changes. And I want you to make those changes. But we is the language of ministry, is it not? It's us. It's not me and you. It's us. We're the church. 
And I wonder what changes God's wanting and what things God's wanting to reveal to you. You get caught up in all these areas when you don't make, you know, again, the last three years, if you haven't learned, if you haven't learned this, revealed how much, and let's say it, I don't know who you are in particular, but you're listening to me right now, and it's revealed how much you idolize your comfort and ease and the luxury in your life. And God will have none of it. It it will not last forever. God will disrupt it so that your singular priority and focus will be worship of God. And you can even have things that are good take priority over Jesus. It's not even necessarily sinful stuff. Like you, you can have priorities, you know, that take your eyes and your mind and your focus away from the Lord. And it's just not as hard for us. And I think that's where Philip is in some ways in his own life. It's different because we're all different. And God is calling you to take one step at a time. If you obey step one, God will give you step two. But then can I have three, four, and five? No. Because you need to obey two to get three. And three to get four. And so much stagnation happens in the believer's life because you don't obey step one. I can't believe God's not doing anything in my life. I can't believe everybody has all this step of walk of faith and I don't, I don't have, I guess I don't hear from the Lord. Oh, you hear from the Lord very well. You just need to go back to what you heard and obey it. When you arise and go, you're never going to meet the Ethiopian eunuch and, uh, and have the gospel go back to Ethiopia until you leave Samaria. Immediate obedience. And, and the title of our study today, are you open, are you sensitive and open to the Holy Spirit? Well, let, let's just use some opposite words. Instead of sensitive, let's ask this, are you stubborn and closed to the Holy Spirit? <laughs> How's that for a title? Are you just stubborn? You know, some people, they wear stubbornness like a badge. Oh, I'm just stubborn. Well, repent then. Don't be so stiff-necked. Stubbornness is not a good attribute to have because then you're going to be stuck in your way and God's way will be set aside. And Philip, we're learning, and really this is the story of every true believer, except it's just really highlighted in Philip's life here. Philip was just open. It reminded me, I want to show you this, and then we'll close. In Genesis chapter 24, in Genesis chapter 24, I want you to turn there. Would you go back with me? We're not there in our midweek Bible study. We're studying through Genesis now, uh, but we're not in this chapter yet. It's the testimony of Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, who was given this impossible task. Go find the exact woman for my son to marry. There is a woman, I want you to find her. And he does by taking the step and heading off and being led by God. When he comes back in Genesis 24, listen to his testimony. Notice in verse 27, Genesis 24. And I want you to see this because I quote it so often, I want you to know the address. Genesis 24, 27. Eliezer's testimony, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. And then mark this. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brother. On the way. You got to get moving. You got to go forward. In obedience. Small things. Being faithful. Hungering and thirsting for what is right. Knowing that God has a direction for your life. As believers, our highest goal should be to know God. Don't be so, con- if you would just desire to know God as much as you want to know his will, as much as you want to know the next step, as much as you want politics to change, as much as you, if you would just want to know God that much, radical change would come to your life almost immediately. But you're losing out. Because you have all these tributaries of the river of life sucking dry the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. Our highest goal is to know God. Why? To know Him is to know His will for your life. 
You say, Ed, did you just make that up? No, Jesus taught us that. In John chapter 17 and verse 3 in his high priestly prayer, remember what Jesus said? He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's eternal life, to know God. Not to know the Bible as much as you know God. Not to know theology as much as you know God. Not to be the best prayer or server or giver, but to know God, his character and his nature, and to follow him. When you know God, you'll be able to drown out all the lies. And again, in the last few years, if you haven't recognized this, I'm going to tell you again from my spiritual position of leadership. I want you to understand this. Some of you already seen it, but some of you haven't. These last three years have shown us how there are just so many voices and opinions and theories begging for you to align yourself with them. And each little one takes you away from the purity of the gospel. Even if they might have good truth, some kind of part of truth to them, they're not the Lord. How is that theory you've held on to helping you to worship God better? How is that YouTube guy that you're following now help you worship God better? How, how, how is it that that opinion that you had passed on to you at a family dinner, how is that helping you know God more? Because if it's not, then it needs to take a subordinate position, if not be eliminated from your life altogether. Philip is in a place of purity in the midst of revival sensitive and open to the holy spirit and he follows through and even a greater thing is going to happen so church i beg you you guys listening from afar wherever you're listening to me i beg you on the authority of god's love and care for you to be sensitive and open to the holy spirit wait on the lord and he will renew your strength. But as you're waiting, act on what he tells you so that you can continue step by step to honor God with your life. Give him a chance. Give him a chance, church. Don't just settle for religious activity, but step into the dynamic of being led by the Spirit, being open to the Spirit. And we'll see the fruit of this step of faith in Philip's life the next time we're together. So Father, we pray for a fresh repentance, perhaps, rededication, or as we'll sing in a moment, a resurrender. We need your help, God. Because even things that we are involved in right now have replaced the dynamic of just following you. And we're sorry. Develop in us a godly sorrow, God, that we might respond to you, we might grow in you, and we might find our, su our sum and substance in the days that we have, living life in the dynamic obedience of following you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.